somewhere on the the order of 550 tests here based on this list, just quick math. But you notice that I'm not showing a graph that says, okay, well, the total number of planned tests is like this, up to 550. Uh, rather, what I've done is I've actually broken them down in each um, uh, two-week period I am referring to as a test pass. And the plan number of tests, cumulative plan number of tests, uh, grows. And then as I start the next pass, I reset. Now, why break it into batches like this? What, what's the advantage of this thing versus this, this thing here like that, just graphing on total number of tests? Well, the reason is that uh, you might actually at some point or another get blocked in some tests that you don't run early on in the project, and you go back and run those later uh, because they were part of a subsequent, uh, you were planning on running them later anyway. Well, what do you do at that point? Do you count those tests twice? And you're going to say, I'm going to claim the credit for them previously, even though I didn't run them, and then you can have this thing spike up. My experience with trying to do that, trying to keep on track when you, excuse me, graph these things all um, uh, like this, just you know, start at zero and go up to 500 or 550 or 600, whatever the total number of tests is, is that you start engaging in little nasty kind of kludges to try to, to stay on track. And people ask you questions about it. You have to admit the ledger domain that is going on and damages your credibility. And this way, by breaking these things down pass by pass, you basically establish some independence from one pass to another. People were really interested in what's going on now anyway. OK, so again, um, you know, pass here. Oh, by the way, the little notch, that's the weekend again. Remember, it's lunacy to plan for weekend work. You might do it if you have to to catch up, but don't plan for it, because then you've got no way to catch up. And the little boxes here are the, uh, are the actuals. Um, okay, this is actual. And, then, and this is all looking pretty good, because you can see here that for the most part, the actuals are above and to the left of the lightning bolts, for the most part, or, or right on them, which is good. And that means we're uh, getting ahead of schedule on the tests a little bit and um, getting done at least as many tests as we uh, plan to get done or close to it. Now, what's not good are the little pluses and minuses down here. Those aren't really necessarily looking good. That looks pretty good. Uh, well, it looks better. The plus is above the minus, but not by much. But here we see the minus dramatically above the plus. But you know, there can be very good reasons for this. Maybe new features are being introduced. If we're following an incremental lifecycle model, we could be getting new features dropping in every four weeks or something into this uh, system integration test process. And uh, you know, that could easily be the reason why that we're, uh, we're seeing these kinds of uh, jumps in the number of failed tests from uh, uh, certain passes. Excuse me. OK, so uh, yeah. Now, all right, we looked at bugs. We looked at test progress. We looked at, um, looked at test cases. Um, and it's still possible, as I said before, that we could be massively screwing up here. <laughs> we could be not testing what we said we were going to test. So, you know, are we covering what we set out to cover? Well, let's say, for example, you're doing risk-based testing. So in risk-based testing, as uh, some of you know, those of you who've heard me talk about it before know, um, you uh, base your tests on the risks. Uh, you do a quality risk analysis. You identify risk items. You build tests from the risk items. You go to cover those during your testing. So, you know, how are we doing in terms of covering our, uh, our quality risks? Well, this graph can help tell us. We've Group the quality risks together by categories here. You see that? Categories. And each one of these would have some number of risk items associated with it. We're not showing a detailed breakdown of the risk item, uh, though we could on a category by category basis if we had that level of traceability, which would be good to have. Um, for each risk item, we're looking at two things. What percentage of the tests that are associated with that risk item have been run? Okay, what percentage have we run? That's not, uh, see what happened to my art school application here. Why don't we go ahead and clear that off of there. Um, so yeah, so what percentage 
going to run. And this should just go up towards 100%. It'll land somewhere up here, hopefully, in the 100% region. Now, when I say in the 100% region, you might be thinking, well, what do you mean? Are you going to run all the tests? Well, you know, again, like I was talking about before, you might, for perfectly good reasons, might decide to skip some tests and not, not get to them. And, uh, you know, or you might add some tests because you discover the risk is higher than you thought. So, you know, saying it's got to get to exactly 100% each one of the risk categories not necessarily realistic. Um, now, those are the gray bars. The gray bars are the percentage of tests uh, that have uh, been run. Now, now some people look at this and go, well, you know, I don't want a stack bar chart. Here's what I want. I want a stack bar chart so that the, you know, I just look at the number that have failed up on the top and the number that have passed up down below, and I want you know, red and green stuff. And yeah, you can do that, absolutely. You know, there's all, you can always add a little bit more data and a little more bells and whistles, but of course, you know, if you do that, you're going to have to teach people how to read it, and you know, it's uh, an incremental hit in terms of how long it takes for them to master reading the slides, and you know, it's just all, it's really up to you as to is that, uh, is that worth it, and do they need that information? Again, remember what, you know, what is the goal of this, uh, and who are you communicating with? Okay, so we've got that. We also have... Um, the little white bars down here, the hollow bars. Uh, now, those guys, this is the percentage of bugs that are attributed, associated with each quality risk category. Okay? Uh, so these, the gray bars, these guys here go up to 100%. As I said, they'll move up this way. They, uh, you know, as time goes on, they, they go up. But the, the white bars, the hollow bars, uh, they always total to 100%, and they can flux around here a little bit. And you'll notice that this is sorted so that the quality risk category with the greatest number of bugs reported against it is the one on the left-hand side of the chart. Uh, now, then what, can you, what can you see in this chart? How can you read it? Well, take a look at this first group of four risk categories here, these guys. Oops, not that guy. Those guys. Uh, so those uh, those four categories of quality risks are the ones that have the um, um, test coverage, you know, around 40 percent. So there's still a fair amount of testing left to be done, and between them, they account for a sizable uh, percentage, um, well over half of the total. Number of bugs. In fact, maybe even close to 60% of the total number of bugs there. So certainly, from a risk point of view, you know that's uh, that's not the risk is pretty high there. Now, let I me mean, take a look at this guy here. The interfaces. You know, what, let's let's go ahead and start with a clean slate. This guy interfaces. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a significant number of bugs relative to some of these other guys, but most of the testing's been done, so the risk is pretty low comparatively. At least the risk is contained. We're probably not looking at a lot of surprises. These guys here are also, uh, you know, they're getting into the 50% range of tests have been run, and they're kind of in the middle in terms of bugs. So it's sort of a medium-ish kind of risk. Here we're getting into the low end kind of risk, usability. Uh, just really, you know, usability, not seeing a lot of bugs. Same with installation, not seeing a lot of bugs. So, you know, that's low risk. Now this guy, localization. Hmm, I don't know localization, what can we say about that? Well, not much. Localization is kind of a wild card, right? Because you haven't run enough tests against it to really know. It could be pretty risky. Competitive inferiority, documentation, state of handling, you know, we run about half the tests and really haven't found much. Now, the other, by the way, the other over here is um, we're doing risk-based testing. Our tests are based on risk. Well, what about those bugs that we found that don't, uh, didn't come from a particular test? You know, doing... Uh, Reactive testing, like using Whitaker's attacks method, or um, or exploratory testing, or bug taxonomy, or something like that. You know, and, um, we find tests, we find bugs. Excuse me, and, and that could be, you know, it's got a trouble sign of well, maybe there's a hole in our risk analysis. Now here, you know, it's well below five percent, so we're probably looking pretty good on that. And you can also show this information as a table if you want, which provides yet more detail. And again, you can even, you know, like I was talking about before, you could break this down so you get planned actual and then the actual path.